to this uh, fourth edition of Aztec on Air. Aztec on Air is uh, the possibility for Aztec to offer to our members uh, worldwide uh, a, a meeting, an encounter with a, an expert in, in, in a field that is not directly related to our field, but whose expertise can help us actually every day in doing our work better. And today we are really uh, blessed with a, one of the most significant experts uh, in the scientific field and also one that is related to one of the most, uh, uh, the biggest questions that uh, our planet is facing these days. And so uh, thanks uh, Jean-Pascal van der Perzeel to join us uh, for, for the discussion. You have an extremely busy schedule. <laughs> uh, and, and so with this kind of a miracle that we had half an hour out of that schedule for you to, uh, to join us. So really thank you again for, uh, for doing this. And so I, I, have a, I wonder a little bit about something uh, maybe a bit personal, but when you started as a student, uh, and I'm not assuming know exactly when that was, but for me it was early 70s, so you know, uh, for you also probably 70s or 80s, uh, what decided you to, to, to go for climate sciences at that time? Well, you know, I, I actually, that was not my initial project. Uh, I had a passion for astronomy and, and science in general, but astronomy in particular. I was an amateur an astronomer, uh, amateur astronomer, and I still am. And I really wanted to become an astrophysicist. And I started to study physics for that reason. Mm -hmm. But then, in the course of my studies, after two, or three, two years, actually, my bachelor degree, I realized I was also... Uh, very much interested by human issues. And at that time, at the University of Louvain, when I was a physics student, uh, there was a new department um, with, with research on climate change that was starting under the leadership of André Berger. Uh, and uh, I realized that, after all, the Earth is a planet, you know? So, in a sense, studying the Earth is also, in a, in a way, astronomy. Uh, but by studying climate change, I could be very close to astronomy uh, and at the same time very close to human subjects because climate is very important for the um, habitability of the planet and for the people and the ecosystems at the surface of this planet. So that's how I shifted hmm. from astrophysics to um, climate science and, and started to uh, study climate. And as a student, I was very lucky. Uh, to uh, participate in 1979, um, I was close to the end of my physics studies. In 1979, I, I, I was able to participate to the first World Climate Conference in Geneva. This was actually against the advisor of André Berger, so this was not a place to, uh, uh, to go for students. And I managed to get an accreditation to go to that WMO, World Meteorological Organization, uh, conference, which was the first big conference where scientists and policy makers met around the climate change issue, and this was um, 35, more than 35 years ago. Yes, but w were you aware at that time that it would become such a big issue today? Uh, because I, I cannot remember at that time, there may have been discussions in the scientific community, but certainly no one besides that would imagine that the climate issue and the global warming was going to become such a big issue for the planet, right? Well, some some um, scientists um, in, in Europe and in the, in the US in particular had understood it was becoming it, it was becoming a big a big thing, and uh, the, this conference I attended in Geneva was a testimony to that. There were there were four hundred or five hundred people, uh, many ministers and policy makers, and. Uh, uh, this was not so long after the uh, Sahel drought, um, which had really uh, impressed many people by the intensity and the, the human consequences. So, um, you know, climate change was uh, emerging uh, then as, 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 as something that, that was becoming important, uh, becoming important, at least I guess. For part of the community. I guess what I'm trying to say is that it may have been for the scientific community at that time, it certainly was not for the general public at that time. And there yeah, may be not have been such a big attempt from the scientific community to share that with the public. Yes, that's right. E even though I funded my uh, 
participation to that conference by a series of newspapers article and this was published in uh, on, on half pages in, in, in a major uh, Belgian newspaper on, on page two for three succeeding days so I, I was already then involved in, uh, <laughs> in in explanation of what climate change is um, uh, was was meaning okay and how did you then end up being part of the IPCC so that's been uh, quite a, a tragic yeah. Right. Well, that was later, actually. That's only, quote-unquote, 20 years ago. I started in '95 by attending the end plenary of the um, uh, second assessment uh, report. Uh, uh, that's the, uh, the report where the famous sentence on the uh, discernible human influence on the climate system was uh, adopted, and I participated actively to, to the uh, negotiation I was the Belgian delegate then, um, and, and I was the only delegate for Belgium, so I could um, do what what uh, I thought was was right uh, scientifically. And um, this was where that very important sentence uh, was was adopted, sentencing for the first time that from the clouds of data, the, the clouds of observations, uh, the the signal. Uh, from human activities was emerging as something that was uh, visible. So that was my first involvement in IPCC. Then I became an author later uh, for the third assessment report and after that I was elected on the Bureau mm -hmm. of the IPCC for the first time in 2002 and then elected Vice Chair in 2008. And now I'm running to become the Chair, if possible. Yes, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. So, but what would you say then uh, is the biggest achievement to date of the IPCC. What, how would you uh, synthesize that a little bit? I know it's a lot, it's big reports and there is a lot of aspects to it, but I, I guess that there are a number of, of, of really important ideas that you want that the public know about these IPCC reports. Well, you know, progressively the IPCC um, conclusions became clearer and clearer, but they were quite clear already in the first report. Uh, it was only uh, an increasing level of, of clarity in the messaging uh, and, and, of course, new, new data which, which allowed that. Uh, but um, the IPCC concluded um, relatively early that um, the mechanism, the physics was, was well understood, uh, the mechanism of the greenhouse effect, the, the mechanism of the uh, carbon cycle and the accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere um, and, and, and the resulting warming. Of course, climate modeling has made a lot of progress over the last uh, 25 years since the beginning of the IPCC, but the, um, the main ideas um, the main conclusions were already present uh, in the first IPCC report, which was very important because it, it informed the um, negotiations leading to the adoption of the um, Climate Convention. Few people know that the uh, Climate Convention text is, is closely inspired by an annex, an appendix, uh, to the um, to the first uh, assessment report of the IPCC. Then the second assessment report of the IPCC, published in '95, uh, was very important to inform the negotiations leading to the Kyoto Protocol in '97. The third report in 2001 was very important to um, um, emphasize and, and help the negotiation uh, realize that adaptation uh, to climate change was important as well. So it, it, it gave credence to the, uh, uh, to the issue of uh, adaptation and the need for adaptation uh, for the part of climate change that we cannot avoid anymore. Uh, then the, the fourth report uh, that was published in 2007 when the IPCC, uh, and after that report the IPCC received the Nobel Peace Prize um, said very, very clearly in a quantified manner that it was um, very likely uh, that, the, that the warming of the past 50 years was indeed uh, mostly due uh, to human activities and to greenhouse gas, uh, gases in particular. Uh, and then the latest report um, confirmed that uh, it replaced very likely by, by extremely likely a probability or a certainty level of 95 percent, but it also in the solution space, which is explored by the working group two and the working group three uh, part of the report uh, by the IPCC, 
uh, it put those solutions in the context of sustainable development and that's it's, that is a relatively new uh, framing um, that was not present at the beginning of the IPCC and which is uh, actually helping more and more uh, policy makers to um, uh, to design policies uh, that are, that aim at protecting the climate system, adapting to the climate uh, changes that we cannot avoid anymore, uh, uh, but also uh, while pursuing other societal objectives which are and also important. And not so later than today, actually, an article was published uh, that I saw uh, that meant said exactly that climate change may jeopardize the actual realization of the new sustainable development goals if we don't act yeah. on climate change. Yeah. Well, in fact, it's actually almost what we ju you just expressed is almost a quotation from the last report. Uh, the okay. last report said explicitly that climate change is becoming a threat yeah. to sustainable development. Exactly. And so, but for the public, the all is difficult to understand because you say likely, extremely likely, yeah. and all that. And I know that these are notions that are very difficult. So people that find parts of this report, uh, it's difficult for them to judge how important the different elements are uh, compared to each other. For example, I give you uh, one thing that is not clear is, are the extreme weather events a result of the human uh, influence on, on, on the planet or not? Yeah. So how much likely is that to be true? Well, you know, it's a question I've, I've, I've heard from journalists over the past few days because of the heat wave, the terrible heat wave in Pakistan, and then a few weeks ago, the terrible heat wave in India, which killed thousands of people, and poor people in particular in India, and, and these days in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I told them that they should start to, uh, to, to ask actually a different question. I mean, could such events not be influenced by climate change because the climate system uh, is 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 in, in a different context today than what it was 50 years ago. I mean the composition, the chemical composition of the atmosphere has significantly changed. Uh, we were slightly above uh, 300 ppm parts per million of CO2 50 years ago and we are now at 400. I mean, it's a big change, and there are many other big changes in the uh, in the climate system. So the entire climatic context is different, and it would be very surprising if if extreme events, heat waves, intense precipitation, etc., would not be influenced by this um, uh, different context. I understand. So, uh, what would you say, uh, uh, looking forward, not from the political point of view, but from the scientific point of view, what do you think would be the the new tracks or the new important tracks that researchers should be embracing to 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 understand better what's going on and uh, and, and and find new evidence, maybe? Well, you, you know, the IPCC. Um, I mean, it's a question I, I'm not going to ask to to answer fully because the IPCC is is really trying not to be normative and not to tell governments or scientists you have to do this, you have to do that. Uh, we we have to we have to to assess in the, in the most objective manner the state of knowledge on the basis of the existing literature. Of course, we can uh, in that process also identify. Um, gaps and knowledge gaps and um, highlights uh, where additional work is needed, but we need to be cautious in, in not being uh, too prescriptive. Yeah. But just an example. Yeah. yeah, let's take an example. If, if we stand back a little bit, the, um, the, um, the amount of warming that is associated at equilibrium, that means after waiting long enough for the climate system to be in equilibrium with the new conditions, for a doubling of the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, that range of warming is approximately from 1.5 to 4.5 degrees Celsius, which is a big range. It's a factor of three. Yeah. And this range has been approximately as large over the last 25, if not uh, 30 um, years. Mm -hmm. And it, it would really be good uh, to, to try to reduce that, to narrow that range, so that uh, the uncertainty uh, for a given level of CO2 in the atmosphere 
would not be as large. And we know that a big factor explaining that big range is the, uh, the difficulty to represent properly uh, the, um, the behavior of clouds uh, and the, uh, the changes in cloudiness and cloudiness quantity but also height and uh, optical characteristics. So that's certainly one area as far as climate science itself is concerned that's particularly important and that uh, could deliver a better, a, a narrower range uh, of um, warming numbers for, for a given um, greenhouse gas scenario. But there are plenty of other subjects uh, which I'm sure uh, will emerge in the literature in the coming few years and I'm convinced that the sixth assessment report that will be published in, in, a, in, in five or six years from now I guess uh, will be um, very rich and, and even better than, than the past IPCC reports. So, well, thanks for lifting a little bit of the <laughs> of the, the light, sitting a little bit of light on, on the future anyway. So, but you are, uh, my concern is you understand for a little bit of, of the conversation is that it's the things that you say, that you study, and then the way the public perceives it, right? It's, the, it's, it's not necessarily the, the same thing. And, and, and for example, you are very well aware of that. It's a roller coaster being in the IPCC. One day you get the Nobel Prize, and the next day, people accuse you of, of scientific fraud. So how, how can that happen? Well, you know, the, the, the IPCC is a human institution and it does not pretend to, to be perfect. And we are, of course, trying to, to, uh, to be as, as, um, as uh, error-free as possible. But uh, on, on um, big reports like the one we produce with a total of typically 5,000 pages and uh, 800 authors, it's hard to guarantee absolutely uh, that there is absolutely no mistake. Uh, in a human institution, it, it, it's uh, probably not possible 100% uh, of the time. So the IPCC has made uh, errors in the past. It, had, it has not been fast enough to acknowledge them and to correct them. We didn't have procedures at the time um, in 2009 and 2010 when those errors you, you, you mentioned on the rate of melting of the Himalayas glaciers. Exactly. That was the example I was uh, thinking of, of yes, course. Were, were, were discovered. We didn't have procedures uh, to, to, um, uh, to, to correct those errors in an organized way. Uh, and, and this and what happened then helped us to improve the IPCC, to improve the procedures. Now we have an error correction protocol. Actually, we have corrected dozens of small errors since, mm -hmm. and it has not at all been a, a big uh, media uh, subject. They have just been corrected, and in a very transparent manner. If you go to the IPCC website, good news is no news, uh, Jean Pascal. You know that. That's right. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> We, we have improved thanks to what happened then and of course we, we, we will try in the future to, to reduce even more the probability of that kind of things happening by strengthening the review process, by strengthening the procedures, etc. Mm -hmm. But to guarantee 100 percent that there will never be any new mistake is not something I'm ready to bet my hand uh, on. But you, you are running to become the chair, so that's probably going to be one of your, of your major issues, right? Of course, of course. I, I mean, everybody would like the IPCC, almost everybody, I guess, would like the IPCC to make absolutely no error, and I would really um, strive to, to try to get there. But um, the main thing uh, is to reduce the, the probability of having errors, to have quick procedures to correct them, and also to be very transparent and honest uh, in the communication. Communication is very important and we have also in IPCC improved uh, in, the, in that area and we can still improve because yeah. if we explain uh, what is happening then people understand and uh, accept uh, that after all the IPCC is a human institution as well. And then still there is also the, all the politics around the whole thing that this, the scientists cannot control. Uh, so we as Aztec, we were present at the COP meeting in Copenhagen and we, as many others, we were expecting big results from that meeting in Copenhagen in, in 2010, I guess. Uh, especially also because Obama was coming and we, we hoped he was making a big announcement and then it didn't happen. And it's my feeling that the fact that this COP meeting did not really 
achieve or did not really uh, come up with solutions that everyone expected, the, the, the sentiment of the public was that it all doesn't mean anything and that, you know, we will never be able to do anything about this. And there's been a sort of a deception and disillusion about this. Yes, it's very unfortunate, actually, and it's a, it's a little bit, uh, in part at least, a communication problem because very important decisions were taken in Copenhagen, actually. The decision, for example, to, to have uh, as a target uh, for humanity uh, to stay below a warming of 2 degrees uh, Celsius and possibly 1.5 degrees Celsius, and there's a decision whether it should uh, remain 2 degrees or or become 1.5 at the end of this year yeah. as well, in theory, is a very important decision because this is what allows uh, informed discussions on carbon budget, etc., to, to take place. Before that, the objective was very vague. It was to avoid dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. What does it mean? There's no number there. Mm -hmm. so, so Copenhagen uh, was very important uh, for taking that decision and it's also because heads of state and governments were present that this was possible and another reason why, why it was pos it was important and very important is that the decision uh, to to um, to aim at a, at the funding of the order of 100 billion dollars per year to help developing countries to adapt and to mitigate climate change was also taken in Copenhagen. Now, I know uh, that decision, those two decisions actually have not yet been translated completely in practical terms and, and this is one of the challenges uh, of the Paris uh, meeting, but still, in terms of uh, framing, in terms of uh, orientation, those two decisions alone uh, were extremely important. Now, of course, more could have been done in Copenhagen. There was a uh, disappointment that no, uh, more was not obtained in Copenhagen. But still, those two decisions in themselves were very important. And then, since we have had at least uh, four or five others, uh, COP meetings, and we have the feeling that nothing much has moved there, and suddenly COP21 is coming up, and now we have all this new expectation that something big is going to happen. How can we explain that? Well, you know, um, you know that when you have to 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 um, put together on a on a common decision um, a few different uh, groups of people or a few uh, countries around a common problem. It's, it's already difficult. So it's already difficult with two or three countries. When you have 195 countries with different interests, different uh, levels of development, different uh, economies, I mean some um, relying much more on agriculture, some relying much more on the, on, on, on the, uh, the, the, the selling of fossil fuels, others on, on, the, uh, on, on new technologies, etc. I mean such a diversity uh, it, it's not so surprising that getting by consensus, because in the UN they work by consensus, an agreement uh, on how to manage this common good that the uh, climate system uh, is, is so difficult. So it's not surprising. Uh, it shouldn't be so surprising that it takes so much time. Now, it's very frustrating, in particular for scientists, to know that uh, the um, climate system doesn't wait uh, for the climate negotiations to um, to converge, uh, but on the other hand, from a human and political point of view, it's somewhat understandable that it's difficult. But uh, let's let's see, let's hope uh, that in Paris, significant progress is made and that a significant step uh, is done uh, on the way to to protect climate. Any any idea where that would go? A type of or, or a type of resolutions or actions that that that, that will be undertaken after Paris? decisions, well, what do you think? Well, it, it, it's a bit difficult to tell at this stage uh, because we are so, we're, we're still uh, far, far away from Paris. It's another six months. But uh, I was in Bonn a few weeks ago at uh, some preparatory meeting uh, and, and I had a sense that uh, there is a, a general will in, in many, many countries around the table to have an agreement uh, in, in Paris. And I think 
that there was also a sense of realism uh, that may not have been present as much uh, before Copenhagen. Uh, people don't want to repeat uh, the uh, disappointment um, mm -hmm. that was there, at least in part, uh, mm -hmm. in Copenhagen. So I am relatively optimistic there will be uh, an agreement in Copenhagen, but I am also realistic in knowing that this agreement is not going to solve all the problems, mm -hmm. and that unfortunately, after Copenhagen, many more years uh, uh, will be needed. After to Paris, really, you mean? Uh, solve the problem, yeah, after the Paris meeting. Is, uh, is the change of policy in China a big, a big issue here? A big yeah, I think it's a very important uh, evolution. Uh, the, the, um, the, the Chinese uh, people and the Chinese government have both um, seen by themselves the effects of uh, air pollution on one uh, side and, and climate change on the other side because they have desertification problem, they have drought problem, in addition to the uh, air quality problem everybody knows about. So they are now committed at the highest level, but also because of the pressure of the Chinese citizens uh, mm -hmm. to change uh, their reliance on, on coal in particular, and, and this is a big change. Uh, it's interesting to, to see how now the public pressure in China seems to be more important than in the US. Yes, that, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. And probably air quality is, is one factor it's there. One factor, air right? quality is something that affects the health of people immediately, while climate change takes more time to, to, to be um, visible. So, we spoke a lot about the perception that we have and the need for com better communication about what the IPCC does and what the science is behind and all that. But communication is one thing, education is another. And I know that there is this uh, particular Article 6 that normally says, you know, we need to do that, but we, we don't see a lot of it, of it going on. And so, w is there a way to incre the increase the education about the science and the mitigation and other adaptation actions that people could do? Well, it, it's certainly a very important issue, and I, I've worked myself uh, in when I was, before I was elected on the uh, on, on the Bureau of IPCC, I, I helped uh, within the uh, UNFCCC, the Climate Convention, to promote the Article 6 issues and uh, help design the, uh, the work program for, for Article 6. So it is a very important issue, but it's a long-term uh, process. As you know, education takes um, a lot of time and the, the results takes time to, to, to be visible as well. Um, I, I would say that um, still in many countries um, climate change is, is now something that's part of the uh, scientific culture much more so than 10 years ago and that's still a progress. Mm. It doesn't mean that much more could not be done mm. but I, I would still um, be optimistic. Yeah, uh, we have the feeling uh, that uh, young people are much more committed to it than, than yeah. others, right? That's right. I was I was speaking this morning in Brussels to 500 uh, 10 to 12 year old um, uh, young uh, students, pupils, pupils, and they were really committed. They had prepared with their schools the uh, the subject. They knew a lot about the issues, etc. It was really um, energizing to to be with them. Well, we hope that we're going to do something similar. We are preparing with Aztec a, a new participation in the COP21 meeting in Paris where we will show uh, action plans from students from all over the world to try to uh, adapt and to mitigate uh, and, and especially on the energy side. And so we hope that we will be able to communicate there with you about these results. It would be really, really nice for these kids to, to have the chance to discuss that directly with you. With pleasure. With yeah. pleasure. Jean-Pascal, all the best for the election. I hope that you Thank make you. it as the chair of the IPCC. I think everyone here uh, listening to you uh, understands that, that you have a very clear vision and, and you know where you want to go. Uh, we are very supportive of all your work. Thank you for joining us today. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.